Welcome to Open Secrets on Grand Fork's Best Source, a show in which we discuss ideas, concepts, techniques, philosophies, sciences, and indeed truths that are entirely ignored by mainstream information sources and certainly not taught in schools, but are nonetheless truths that better explain the reality in which we now find ourselves. Each episode of our journey will take us through important but often obscure books, many of which were written by highly influential individuals most have never heard of. Many of the subjects to be discussed have the potential to cause that characteristic discomfort that occurs when information collides with emotions, emotions born from preconceptions. But I humbly ask you, dear listener, to ignore this discomfort. Ignore the emotions and engage with the information presented and using your reason, extract and assimilate the explanatory truths which you are unable to refute. This is, after all, the process all truth seekers must undergo. And take your time. You do not have to come to a conclusion right away. Some of you may know me from the Great Reset podcast here on GFPS, but for those who do not, I am Dr. Dan Stanislawski. While I hold a PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry, I do not let this degree limit or pigeonhole me because the truths of our world are not so confined as to be found exclusively in such specialized knowledge sets. And certainly one's intellect ought not to be shackled by higher education. Indeed, if one allows one's mind to be so chained, the truths of our reality will float by completely unnoticed. Several years ago, I sensed for the first time that things were profoundly disordered in our world. This realization ignited in me a thirst for knowledge that would enable me to learn, understand, and explain the sources of this disorder. The journey toward understanding this disorder will reveal its cure. It is this journey I sincerely hope you will join me on as we explore together open secrets. Now that will probably be the second to last time or so that I will be reading that protracted uh, introduction. Uh, Hopefully after a few more episodes, people will just, you know, know what this show is about. Um, But today's offering is a, what I think is a very important book, and it is from 1952, and it is called The Impact of Science on Society, written by Bertrand Russell. Now, Bertrand Russell, um, those who watch The Great Reset on GFPS um, know that I've talk about this guy, I mentioned him quite a bit. And the reason is, is he was incredibly influential. In fact, he's one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. And going beyond that, he may be one of the most influential people of all walks of life of the 20th century. And the reason for that is, besides his his philosophical influence, he was royalty. He was descended from the, a family of the Tudor dynasties, the Russells go back centuries uh, in, in England. Um, and he definitely has a, had a, an arist- aristocratic air about him. He was controversial even for his time, and as you will see, his ideas are still controversial today, but he was controversial for being a pacifist. He actually spoke openly against the First World War and decried the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. However, this is kind of contradictory to what you're about to read and what he said. As a youth, he lamented the lack of war's efficacy in killing people. He wanted more people to be dying from wars. And he actually called for a preemptive nuclear war with the Soviet Union. His work uh, involved mathematics. Originally, he was a mathematician. He wrote several works on mathematics. Then he eventually got into philosophy writ large, which um, one of these books, the book we're about to read now, The Impact of Science on Society, is certainly a philosophical work about society's you know, place in our culture. And he stu- actually studied the U- the Soviet Union, and he went on to give lectures in China on the merits of communism right at the dawn of the communism in China. The Impact of Science Society. Again, I will say, please read this book. Please get a copy of it. I You, you mo- will notice that the copy I have is old. It is a relatively rare book, but please find a PDF of it if you can, because um, maybe I'm wrong. Again, always check me on what I'm saying. I want to, you know, 
you know, convey the truth of the works I am reading. Um, but I think you will agree that after, after reading some sections of this book that his explanations on, a, on what the scientific technique can be used for is to, you know, bring about a one world government and a scientific dictatorship, which from where I'm sitting is absolutely evil. So without further ado, we can get into the first section. This is a, little, a shorter section, but this is on the important effects of the scientific technique. He says, and you'll notice this actually, this actually, this copy is actually from 1968. This book, um, this again, this book was first published in 1952, but someone, um, this old yellow um, highlights, someone did read this book before me, which is pretty cool, um, but they didn't highlight anywhere near as much as I did. But <laughs> we'll begin here. The effect of the telegraph was to increase the power of the central government and diminish the initiative of distant subordinates. This applied not only to the state, but to every geographically extensive organization. We shall find that a great deal of scientific technique has a similar effect. The result is that fewer men have executive power, but those few have more power than such men had formerly. So again, scientific technique concert, um, um, works towards concentrating power in fewer and fewer hands. In all these respects, broadcasting has completed what the telegraph began. Electricity as a source of power is much more recent than the telegraph and has not yet had all the effects of which it is capable. Again, not even close. This is pre-internet era. As an influence on social organization, its most notable feature is the importance of power stations, which inevitably promote centralization. The philosophers of Laputa, I'm not sure what he's referring to here. The philosophers of Laputa could re reduce a rebellious dependency to submission by interposing their floating islands between the rebels and the sun. Something very analogous can be done by those who control power stations. As soon as a community has become dependent upon them for lighting and heating and cooking. I lived in America in a farmhouse which depended entirely upon electricity, and sometimes in a blizzard, the wires would be blown down. The resulting inconvenience would was almost intolerable. If we had been deliberately cut off for being rebels, we should soon have had to give in. So again, this, this impact of science is these new techniques these, with electricity you become dependent upon them. And what he's saying here, and when he lived in America uh, and during a blizzard, the power was knocked out of his, for his house. And of course, we've all experienced similar things and it's, it becomes intolerable if, if that condition lasted for, for us, especially if it lasted for days or weeks on end, that would be deplorable for us. Going beyond what electricity has done, think about the internet. We all use the internet now every day, perhaps every hour of our waking lives, we are on the internet. Pretty soon, everything of value will be moving through the internet, which is to say there will be internet money. Central bank digital currencies will come to pass, which will grant them power, which, which he alludes to here. If you had a central authority controlling power in his day, think about a central authority controlling internet or internet monies today, you will have basically total control of things. And that is the goal. Um, we'll move next to one of, I mean, there, there are several controversial things, but important things that are said in this book. And I actually talked about this section um, on an episode of The Great Reset. I suppose at the time this episode airs, it'll have been a few months past, um, but it's on mass psychology. It says, I think the subject will be, which will be of most importance politically is mass psychology. Mass psychology is, scientifically speaking, not a very advanced study. Again, this is 1952. And so far as its professors has, have not been in universities, they have been advertisers, politicians, and above all, dictators. This study is immensely useful to practical men, whether they wish to become rich or to acquire the government. It is, of course, as a science founded upon individual psychology, but hitherto it has employed rule of thumb methods which were based upon a kind of intuitive common sense. Its importance has been enormously increased by the growth of modern methods of propaganda. Of these, the most influential is what is called education. Religion plays a part, though a diminishing one. Religion is basically done now. The press, the cinema, and the radio play an increasing part. So again, education and media was used, is used actively to manipulate mass psychology Think about, again, COVID-19. COVID-19 is 
mostly a perception management phenomenon. It is a utilizing the tools of mass psychology to control the behaviors of populations. What is essential in mass psychology is the art of persuasion. If you compare a speech of Hitler's with a speech of, say, Edmund Burke, you will see what strides have been made in the art since the 18th century. So again, he's, what, what, is that, what is he saying about Hitler here? He's saying Hitler was using the art of mass psychology in his speech. And if you watch a speech from Hitler, it's a very, you know, invigorating type of speech. He, he is very persuasive and very emotional about how he presents his information, which, as Bertrand Russell is saying, brought a lot more people to his point of view. What went wrong formally was that people had read in books that man is a rational animal and framed their arguments on this hypothesis. Think about that. He's saying most, what he's saying here is most people aren't rational animals. We now know that limelight and a brass band do more to persuade than can be done by the most elegant train of syllogism. Syllogism is deductive logic. So he's saying just by putting on a good show, you can get more people on your side than you can with logical argumentation. And he's absolutely right. It may be hoped that in time, anybody will be able to persuade anybody of anything if he can catch the patient young and is provided by the state with money and equipment. This subject will make great strides when it is taken up by scientists under a scientific dictatorship. Think about what's happening now. Think about COVID-19. Anaxagoras maintained that snow is black, but no one believed him. The social psychologists of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. Various results will soon be arrived at. First, that the influence of home is obstructive. Second, that not much can be done unless indoctrination begins before the age of 10. Third, that verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. You can think of modern music. It's basically all simplistic sixth grade appeal to sexuality intoned to music. And that's what people, you know, that's what's banging around in people's heads over and over and over again. And it's so effective that 20 years later, I'm sure many of you have had this experience, you wouldn't have heard a song, but for some reason the song pops in your head and you remember the exact words. That's the power of music. Fourth, that the opinion that snow is white must be held to show a morbid taste for eccentricity. Think about that now. So that which is normal, that which is obvious, truth of our reality that snow is white must be held to show a morbid taste for eccentricity. So it must be made to look silly. One could say that it would be maintained only by conspiracy theorists. He goes on, but I anticipate it is for future scientists to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black and how much less it would cost to make them believe it is dark gray. So again, he's saying they want to get this fine-tuned control over the control of mass psychology that they can manipulate it to whatever degree is necessary. Although this science will be diligently studied, it will be rigidly confined to the governing class because us peons can't know about this stuff. This is going to be done to us, so we cannot be aware of it. The populace will not be allowed to know how its convictions were generated. Again, I'll repeat that one. The populace will not be allowed to know how its convictions were generated. When the technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for a generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. And interestingly, he goes on, as yet, there is only one country which has succeeded in creating this politician's paradise. And I say, which? Again, I don't know what, which nation he's talking about there. Maybe you don't, but that's very interesting. So a few interesting aspects we can p- apply to our lives today. Sci- the scientific dictatorship is happening now. There are behavioral insights teams which are employed by the United, the, the United States governments and the governments of the United Kingdom. The United States is a man named Cass Sunstein 
who currently works um, in the Department of Homeland Security, interestingly enough. And the Behavioral Insights teams have been a part of the United Kingdom's government for over a decade now. And you can read their literature. And this specifically is what it's all about. The populace will not be allowed to know how its convictions were generated. So you're going to feel like you made a free choice with your will when you go to the, the voting booths or when you do, you know, when you have your conversations. But the reality is that you, your thoughts are not your own and they were planted scientifically in your mind. Um, the next section is just, this is a brief illusion and usually guys like this writing on this subject don't allude to this at all ever. And we'll just read this little section and I'll make a little further comment on that. But it says, Although the peasant's lot is in any case a hard one, it is apt to be rendered harder by one or both of two enemies, the money lender and the land owner. Money lender, land owner. In any history of any period, you will find roughly the following gloomy picture. At this time, the old hardy yeo men stock had fallen upon evil days under the threat of starvation from bad harvests. Many of them had borrowed from urban landowners who had none of their traditions, their ancient piety, or their patient courage. Those who had taken this fatal step became, almost inevitably, the slaves or serfs of members of the new commercial class. And so the sturdy farmers, who had been the backbone of the nation, were submerged by supple men who had the skill to amass new wealth by dubious methods. You will find substantially this account in the history of Attica before Zolon, of Latium before the Punic Wars, of England in the early 19th century, of Southern California as depicted in Norris's Octopus, of India under the British Raj, and of the reasons which have led Chinese peasants to support communisms. communism. There, will, there may still be nominally independent farmers, but in fact, they are in the power of the vast financial interests that are concerned in manipulating political issues. So he's saying societies almost inevitably even he goes through some of these things he's referring to are thousands of years in the past they almost inevitably succumb to the financial powers and of course that is absolutely true of virtually the entire world now and he says there are will be nominally some independent farmers i actually know a few truly independent farmers and that's a really good practice for you dear listener if you get to know some some independent farmers and befriend them it will behoove you i believe in the future to have those type of friends. But this subject, the subject of the financial powers, will be the subject of books dedicated specifically to the financial elite and how they came to pass in the future. But it's interesting to hear one of the, my opinion, one of the oligarchs of his time talk about that, because that's a secret that these guys usually don't like to let out. Here, let me see what our next section is. Oh, yes. One of the more infamous and there's a lot of infamous quotes in this here book um, is the one we're about to read. And this is going to be, this is in a section on uh, the scientific technique in an oligarchy. And an oligarchy is a class of elites essentially who dominate a society. And I believe we are living in a world dominated by a small oligarchy, relatively small oligarchy. <clears throat> so, Let's, let's see what he has to say about this, what science looks like in such a scenario. And he really does project into the future what it will look like as well. I think the evils that have grown up in, the Soviet, in Soviet Russia will exist in a gr greater or less degree wherever there is a, a scientific government which is securely established and is not dependent upon popular support. It is possible nowadays for a government to be very much more oppressive than any government could be before there was scientific technique. Again, so the scientific technique is going to help the, the despots. Propaganda makes persuasion easier for the government. Pub public ownership of halls and paper makes counter-propaganda more difficult. And the effectiveness of modern armaments makes popular risings impossible. Except for in the United, Nation, in the United States, excuse me, where you have a Second Amendment, of course. No revolution could succeed in a modern country unless it has the support of at least a considerable section of the armed forces. Again, except the United States. But the armed forces can be kept loyal by being given a higher standard of life than that of the average worker, and this is made easier by every step in the degradation of ordinary labor. 
Thus, the very evils of the system help to give it stability. Apart from external pressure, there is no reason why such a regime should not last for a very long time. So a well-established, secure scientific dictatorship can last a very long time. And I put in the column here, particularly if, it, particularly if unknown, which I think is one of the goals of Open Secrets is to shine a light on this fact that there is a scientific dictatorship happening right now in our lives. And they're so successful that most people are totally unaware of that fact. He continues, scientific societies are as yet in their infancy. It may be worthwhile to spend a few moments in speculating as to the possible future development of those that are oligarchies, which again, I have a thesis that that is our world. It is to be expected that advances in physiology and psychology will give governments much more control over individual mentality than they now have even in totalitarian countries. Again, keep in mind, he's writing this in 1952. Fichte laid it down. Fichte was a Prussian philosopher who wrote extensively about education. Fichte laid it down that education should aim at destroying free will so that after pupils have left school, they shall be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. So again, he's saying the, that education is supposed to destroy free will and make it in, make one incapable of questioning what they're not supposed to be questioning and combine that again with the previous section on mass psychology and you'll see where he's going here but in his day this was an unattainable ideal what he regarded as the best system in existence produced Karl Marx in the future such failures are not likely to occur where there is dictatorship diet injections and injunctions will combine from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable. And any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. Let me read that again. Diet, injections, and injunctions. What do you think he's talking about here? Diet, injections, and injunctions will combine from a very early age very early age, to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable and any serious criticisms of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. So there's a lot going on there, right? Diet. Think about the Western diet. Think about the explosion of obesity and the sickness resulting therefrom. Most Americans eat a diet of poison. It's very high in carbohydrates. It's got all kinds of toxins with the, with the you know the the dyes and the msg monosodium glutamate all the monosodium glutamate is a known neurotoxin but they can legally put that stuff in your food and it can go under all kinds of names so that the our diet is totally destroying us injections again injections from a very early age he says we inject babies with a you know in this state in the united states of america with a shot that is for a sexually transmitted disease and they test the mother to see if that's Pre pre uh, present in her at birth, right? So it makes no sense to do that. And these things are loaded with aluminum, you know, with, with things that are toxic, with chemicals that are toxic to every biological system, basically. So, and again, first day of life, very early age. And injunction, injunctions are laws. You know, how many, uh, how many laws are there for us peons? And how many of these laws get applied to the elites? Nothing gets applied to the elites, and we get more laws to put upon us every single day, basically. <clears throat> and again, this is going to produce the sort of beliefs that they consider desirable. So there's going to be a scientific indoctrination program that will render one, uh, render it psychologically impossible to criticize the powers that be. Not only is it psychological, I mean, think about some of some, uh, some, uh, the people that you know who are incapable of having a conversation with someone they disagree with now. Like, I mean, physically incapable of it. They go into a rage. They can't form words. They can't form thoughts, right? That is a scientifically indoctrinated position. It goes on to say, even if all are miserable, all will believe themselves happy because the government will tell them that they are so. So not only now, if you're, if you're not happy, what, do, what does the average person do? They go see a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist gives them happy pills. Well, you cannot get happiness through neurochemical reactions. It's not going to happen. In fact, that's an addictive behavior is to keep popping drugs in your mouth. 
right? And then you have to pop in new drugs and more drugs and different drugs. And thankfully, we have our wonderful medical system where they can provide new drugs for you at any whim that you have, you know? So this, it's a manufactured false happiness that we live in for many people. A total, then he's, he's going to start projecting into the future here of what this is going to look like. And really, these are old um, ideas. And I wrote here from Plato, but then I was I read a little further on. He actually mentions Plato because these guys love Plato. And Plato, was, uh, Plato is, you know, they paint him as this, you know, wonderful, benevolent philosopher, but really he was not at all. Um, here we go. A totalitarian government with a scientific bent might do things that to us would seem horrifying. The Nazis were more scientific than the present rulers of Russia and were more inclined toward the sort of atrocities that I have in mind. They were said, I do not know with what truth, to use prisoners in concentration camps as material for all kinds of experiments, some involving death after much pain. If they had survived, they would probably have soon taken to scientific breeding. Any nation which adopts this practice will, within a generation, secure great military advantages. The system, one may surmise, will be something like this. Except possibly in the governing aristocracy, all but 5% of males and 30% of females will be sterilized. The 30% of females will be expected to spend the years from 18 to 40 in reproduction in order to secure adequate cannon fodder. As a rule, artificial insemination will be preferred to the natural method. The unsterilized, if they desire the pleasures of love, will usually have to seek them with sterilized partners. Sires will be chosen for various qualities, some for muscle, others for brains. All will have to be healthy, and unless they are to be the fathers of oligarchs, they will have to be of a submissive and docile disposition. Children will, as in Plato's Republic, be taken from their mothers and reared by professional nurses. Gradually, by selective breeding, the congenital differences between rulers and ruled will increase until they become almost different species. A revolt of the plebs would become as unthinkable as an, un, as an organized insurrection of sheep against the practice of eating mutton. So you see here a, a truly scientific establishment of breeding populations. Obviously, we're not there yet, right? That's, this isn't currently happening, at least in the United States. I don't think it's happening in any nation that I know of, but there are scientific techniques at play here in terms of breeding. Um, specifically, one comes to mind is the loss of the male sperm count. I mean, there's a, there was a documentary in early, the early 2000s from the BBC of all people uh, attesting to this fact that the, the sperm count of, the, of your average British male at that time, and certainly the case in America, had plummeted significantly. Now, if the powers that be, uh, who are scientific dictators, if they had a problem with that, that would be the number one problem that science would be trying to solve, be trying to figure it out. The reason is, is that is an extinction level phenomenon, right? If only a small handful of the population has, of a population of males has viable, you know, sperm, that's a massive issue for our people. But, and it's something that we've been known, of, known about for decades now. And for some reason, people don't care. Very interesting, isn't it? To those accustomed to this system, the family as we know it would seem as queer as the tribal and totem organization of Australian Aborigines seem to us. Slowly but surely, the family is being, you know, you know, blotted out of existence. The laboring class would have such long hours of work and so little to eat that their desires would hardly extend beyond sleep and food. The upper class being deprived of softer pleasures both by the abolition of the family and by the supreme duty of devotion to the state, would acquire the me mentality of ascetics. They would care only for power and in pursuit of it would not shrink from cruelty. By the practice of cruelty, men would become hardened so that worse and worse tortures would, will, would be required to give, them, give the spectators a thrill. And that's what happened in you know, the Colosseum in, in, in Rome. You had to get more and more grotesque gladiatorial combat to satiate the people who are becoming more and more deviant. That's something that's happening certainly in our day. And the upper class he's referring to is not the oligarchs, it's the class above the peasants here. So you see a different world that is possible under a scientific dictatorship. And of course, we're not there yet, but of course, we must stop, you know, these psychopaths from bringing this about. 
And again, yeah, like it's interesting, like he talks Plato here. And again, Plato is in these concepts that Plato thought about thousands of years ago and wrote about for the first time uh, is truly loved by, it's almost as popular as the Malthusian idea of, you know, population outgrowing our ability to support that population through agrarian techniques. So therefore we have to limit population. That idea and Plato's ideas are very popular amongst the eugenicists in particular. So the next section is gets very very interesting even even more interesting is is on how you know we need to avo avoid the extinction of mankind th through nuclear warfare we need to avoid that by submitting to a global government very interesting he says there has always been two kinds of wars those in which the vanquished incur disaster and those in which they only incurred discomfort we seem unfortunately to be entering upon an era in which wars are of the former sort, that is, incur disaster. The atom bomb, and still more the hydrogen bomb, have caused new fears involving new doubts as to the effects of science on human life. Some eminent authorities, including Einstein, have pointed out that there is a danger of the extinction of all life on this planet. I do not myself think that this will happen in the next war, but I think it may well happen in the next but one, if that is allowed to occur. If this expectation is correct, we have to choose within the next 50 years or so between two alternatives. Either we must allow the human race to exterminate itself, or we must forego certain liberties which are very dear to us, more especially the liberty to kill foreigners whenever we feel so disposed. I think it probable that mankind will choose its own extermination as the preferable alternative the choice will be made, of course, by persuading ourselves that it is not being made, since, so militarists on both sides will say, the victory of the right is certain without risk of universal disaster. We are perhaps living in the last age of man, and if so, it is to science that he will owe his extinction. And truly, this is only the case if psychopaths run the world, right? No person who is sane and who has any modicum of love for his neighbor would a commit you know, you know send people to war where there will be mass casualties events but b drop a nuclear weapon on cities that is not something a normal person does right i mean you you're you're causing the death of thousands and thousands and thousands of innocents total innocents that's why when you know we're starting to hear the pangs of war i mean by the time this episode airs i don't know what the the situation with ukraine and russia is going to look like but again it's 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 tending towards the destruction of people uh, that who are totally innocent who don't care about war they, they who probably care like an american citizen they care about your average american citizen why because we're all humans you know i care about the ukrainian people i care about the russian people i don't like their governments i don't like our government governments are the problem and it's because governments are run by psychos who would a commit atrocities of war and b drop nuclear armaments and that's what the people that's who is truly responsible for the extinction of mankind were that ever to happen if however the human race decides to let itself go on living it will have to make very drastic changes in its way of thinking feeling and behaving we must learn to say never better death than dishonor here we go we must learn to submit to law even when imposed by aliens whom we hate and despise and whom we believe to be blind to all considerations of righteousness well this psycho is the alien that would be imposing these laws right so how free do you think we will be we certainly won't be free we will certainly be under absolute dictatorial rule so these are the types of laws he's asking you to consider or the alternative is extinction no it's not that's not the alternative we i reject uh bertrand russell's premises here big time again if if virtuous good people were running the show this wouldn't be the, these won't be issues here it will be obvious to anyone who is an interested party in one of these disputes, he mentioned a line of disputes above here, that the issue is far more important than the continuance of life on the planet, meaning the people who are having this, these contentions, their issue in their minds is more important than the continuation of life on the planet. 
The hope that the human race will allow itself to survive is therefore somewhat slender. Again, I, I reject that. But if human life is to continue in spite of science, mankind will have to learn a discipline of the passions, which in the past has not been necessary. Again, men will have to submit to the law, even when they think the law unjust and iniquitous. Nations which are persuaded that they are only demanding the barest justice will have to acquiesce when this demand is denied them by the neutral authority. I do not say that this is easy. I do not prophesy that it will happen. I say only that if it does not happen, the human race will perish and will perish as a result of science. A clear choice must be made within 50 years, the choice between reason and death. And by reason, I mean willingness to submit to law as declared by an international authority. I fear that mankind will choose death. I hope I am mistaken. Well, you know, international authorities and global governance is not in and of itself evil, right? There is a theoretical possibility that an international government is, in fact, a benevolent one. But that not, is absolutely not the scenario in which we find ourselves. I, for one, will be a dead man before these guys are controlling the international authority. I mean, a, a, a reading of the, ch the Charter of the United Nations is very much a reading of the Communist Manifesto. They're, they're very close on what they define liberty to be, and it is not individual liberty, ladies and gentlemen. And that is something that we all must be aware of and must oppose, but they're just, you know, dressing these ideas in the name of science. They're scientifically manipulating us to these ends. So scientific well-being is ensured. <clears throat> science offers the possibility of far greater well-being for the human race than has ever been known before. It offers this on certain conditions. Abolition of war, even distribution of ultimate power, amongst whom, one must ask, and limitation of the growth of population. That's the big one. And the last section we'll read, he really opines on that. The preponderant power can establish a single authority over the whole world and thus make future wars impossible. At first, this, this authority will, in certain regions, be based on force. But if the Western nations are in control, force will, as soon as possible, give way to consent. Now, why does he say that? If Western nations are in control, force will soon, as possible, give way to consent. And I believe that is because Western nations are um, scientifically produced to be more docile, right? And so if using our scientific dominance, because one can easily make the case that the Western powers have more military and scientific and technical new than Eastern powers. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but we, we are much more likely to submit in a scientific dictatorship, I believe, than the Eastern nations. I could be wrong. When that has been achieved, the most difficult of world problems will have been solved. And that is, of course, establishing the world um, regime. And science can become wholly beneficent. Again, does the scientific breeding sound beneficent to you? Beneficent for whom? I do not think there is a reason to fear that such a regime, once established, would be unstable. The chief causes of large-scale violence are love of power, competition, hate, and fear. Love of power will have no national outlet when all serious military force is concentrated in the international army. Because again, there, I mean the love of power will be totally trained out of people except for the people who actually have it. Competition will be effectively regulated by law and mitigated by governmental controls. Wide diffusion of malevolence is one of the most unfortunate things in human nature, and it must be lessened if a world state is to be stable. What that means is they're going to make you, they're going to condition you to love your world state. I am persuaded that it can be lessened and very quickly if peace becomes secure and there will be a very rapid increase of material prosperity and this tends more than anything else to provide a mood of kindly feeling. Again, this is where we are. I mean, this paragraph here is where we are in 2022 here. I mean, uh, you, you we're giving our creature comforts 
the likes of which humanity has never seen before. I mean, your average Joe who lives on universal basic income welfare has more creature comforts at his fingertips than the most powerful monarchs, monarchs of yesteryear. I mean, for, for thousands of years, humanity had one basic mode of life and it certainly didn't involve electricity. And think about what's how your average Joe that can sit and pop Doritos and, you know, drink Mountain Dew and play video games his whole life. Think about what that looks like, right? It's a very different way of life. And that is the scientific control uh, manifesting itself. A great deal also is to be hoped from a change in propaganda. Nationalist propaganda in any violent form will have to be illegal and children in schools will not be taught to hate and despise foreign nations. Again, because there'll, there will be no foreign nations and you will be you know, taught to love your nation, uh, which is the global nation, right? Active instruction in the evils of the old times and the advantages of the new system would do the rest. I am convinced, and here's this last sentence is a very interesting one. It's kind of a tongue in cheek one, in my opinion. I am convinced that only a few psychopaths would wish to return to the daily dread of radioactive disintegration. And I say, no, it's because the psychopaths will have found new tools, right? Because he's talking, my opinion, about him and the people he knows. And the discussions they have where only a few people behind those closed doors have the tendency to want radioactive destruction of, of humanity where, well, hey, we got all these new tools, including the control of and manipulation of mass psychology. Let's just use those instead. That's what he's saying. He's like, hey, our, my fellow psychopaths, we're going to use these newfangled approaches to human behavior control and human thought control, which, again, 70 years later, 70 years after this book, to me, very little of what he's talking about has been stopped, and a lot of it is coming to pass. And so here we'll get into the last section, and that is population control and the, the, the necessity of the world government to achieve that. What is the inevitable result if the increase of population is not checked? Again, Malthusian, Malthusian, Malthusian. There must be a very general lowering of the standard of life in what are now prosperous countries. With that lowering, there must go a great diminution in the demand for industrial products. Detroit will have to give up making private cars and confine itself to lorries. <laughs> Such things as books, pianos, watches will become the rare luxuries of a few exceptionally, exceptionally powerful men, notably those who control the army and the police. Again, so he's, he's rationalizing. What he's doing here is he's rationalizing population control because he says his population spirals out of control with which many people now think has it already has there's going to be a a you know these luxuries like watches and pianos etc cetera, etc cetera, are going to become incredibly rare is that the case i don't think so so again the rationalization is is continuing here in the end there will be a uniformity of misery and the malthusian law will reign unchecked the world having been technically unified, population will increase when world harvests are good and diminish by starvation whenever they are bad. Most of the present urban and industrial centers will have become derelict and their inhabitants, if still alive, will have reverted to the peasant hardships of their medieval ancestors. The world will have achieved a new stability, but at the cost of everything that gives value to human life. And mere are mere numbers so important that, for their sake, we should patiently permit such a state of affairs to come about? Again, that's what he refers humanity, mere, mere numbers. Are mere, I mean, again, that's just, this is the lingo of a psychopath. Are mere no, numbers so important that, for their sake, we should patiently permit such a state of affairs to come about? Surely not. What then can we do? Again, he provides a premise which is patently false and then provides his solution for that. What then can we do? Apart from certain deep-seated prejudices, the answer would be obvious. The nations which at present increase rapidly should be encouraged to adopt the methods by which, in the West, the increase of population has been checked. Educational propaganda, with government help, could achieve this result in a generation. There are, however, two powerful forces opposed to such a policy— one is religion and the other is nationalism. Gee, what do you think they've tried to destroy since his time? They have destroyed religion, right? I mean, virtually everyone is irreligious nowadays, and even people who claim their religion 
so few of them actually live that religious life. And the other is nationalism. What do you think they're on the verge of destroying? The, this, especially the World War I, you had you know, a, a bunch of nation states that certainly chose sides, but the quabbling brought this world war. And then right after World War I, they tried to establish the League of Nations. You had World War II, again, a bunch of nation states quabbling. The result is nuclear war, which ended it. Right, but then they had the United Nations shortly thereafter. So again, they're using this this war technique to adopt uh, uh, an international legislative body. Again, so they want to get rid of nationalism. I think it is the duty of all who are capable of facing facts to realize and to proclaim that opposition to the spread of birth control, if successful, must inflict upon mankind the most appalling depth of misery and degradation and that within another 50 years or so so again birth control doesn't stop humanity's in for you know in for a really 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 rough rough time which again i think is total bollocks i do not pretend that birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing there are others which one must suppose opponents of birth control would prefer again what why would one have to suppose that War, as I remarked a moment ago, has hitherto been disappointing in this respect, but perhaps bacteriological war may prove more effective. Hmm. If a black death could be spread throughout the world once in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. Geez, that isn't that just a wonderful thought? Let's just keep, you know, let's just make some some wonderful um you know, viruses or bacteria and spread them across the globe and kill lots of people every generation, then yeah, you can, you can, you don't have to have birth control in that scenario. <clears throat> there are three ways of securing a society that shall be stable as regards population. The first is that of birth control. The second is that of infanticide or really destructive wars. And the third, that of general misery, except for a powerful minority. <laughs> All these methods have been practiced. The first, for example, by the Australian Aborigines, the second by the Aztecs, the Spartans, and the rulers of Plato's Republic. And that was the infanticide thing where, you know, a lot of the Spartans would kill their female babies or, you know, whatever. If they were malformed in some way, they'd just, you know, throw them in the pit or whatever it was. And the third in the wor world as some Western internationalists hope to make it and in Soviet Russia. Again, so, I mean, he says Soviet Russia there, it's like, again, the state of general misery except for power from minority. That's the third scenario. And as some West, Western internationalists hope to make it, I wonder who those could be, and what was going on in Soviet Russia. So, again, these are the scenarios which he says, you know, are inevitable without, you know, proper birth control. Of these, only birth control avoids extreme cruelty and unhappiness for the majority of human beings. Meanwhile, so long as there is not a single world government there will be competition for power among the different nations and an increase of population brings the threat of famine. National power will become more and more obviously the only way of avoiding starvation. There will therefore be blocks in which the hungry nations band together against those that are well fed. That is the explanation of the victory of communism in China. I don't think that's the only explanation, but we'll get into that some future time. These considerations prove that a scientific world society cannot be stable unless there is a world government. The need for a world government, if the population problem is to be solved in any humane manner, is completely evident on Darwinian principles. Given two groups, of which one has an increasing and the other a stationary population, the one with the increasing population will, other things being equal, in time become the stronger. After victory, it will cut down the food supply of the vanquished, of whom many will die. This is something that happened in the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union killed millions, I mean, untold millions. Low estimates are 60 million of its own population. A really good book we might you know, get into someday about, called Democide, which is death by government. They had to coin a new term for it. And what they did is, in, in, in Ukraine, it was literally in, the, in the, the land that is now Ukraine, it was then too, um, they, they cut off the food supply to that entire nation. And when within a few years, they starved 7 million people to death. That's the Soviet Union doing that. That's the guys who are still running the show, by the way, the people behind the Soviet Union. Therefore, there will be a continually renewed victory of those nations that, from a world point of view, are unduly prolific. 
This is merely the modern form of the old struggle for existence, and this end given scientific powers of destruction, a world which allows this struggle to continue cannot be stable. And again, how does he you know, contend that we should, we should stop this? It is a one world government uh, where you and I will have absolutely no say in what is going on. Now, why isn't this book taught in schools? Why isn't Bertrand Russell talked about? You know, you have to think about that. I'm of the opinion that it was, it is quite clearly intentional to keep these ideas from circulating in the minds of the youth, uh, in the minds of people as they're growing up. Because what would happen is you start to see that that is indeed, a lot of the ideas that he talks about here are indeed the scenario we now find ourselves in. To me, it is undeniable that, that we find ourselves in this, and it is undeniable that we are moving towards a global dictatorship. I believe we are currently in a global dictatorship. It's just not a out in the open yet. And I believe in the years to come, perhaps the next decade, I believe it will be open and there will be a new way of life and a new economic system. Indeed, not in this book, in, in some of Bertrand Russell, Russell's other writings, one of which for sure we will get to at some point, um, he talks about a, an electronic currency system being established. So, which will, I mentioned that at the beginning of the episode, which will give them total control. So to me, this is a very important work and it's full of very controversial ideas, but ideas that eugenicist, Malthusian psychopaths have been talking about and thinking about for a very long time. And that is to bring in a scientific dictatorship. And I believe, like I said, they have almost achieved that totally, which, why, which is why we need to be aware of it, A, and then B, find solutions for it. That wraps up this episode of Open Secrets. Thank you, dear listener. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being here. Um, if you have any um, you know, comments, please, I can be reached at daniel at realcovidfacts.org. Join us next time. The book will be Charles Galton Darwin's The Next Million Years. And God bless you and please take care of yourself. Thank you.